Summer's my jam. Why are you tripping? <laughs> hey, Spanky, what are you doing? What are you doing? You need help? Let me show you. Steve's on the grumpy side today. Thank you! Big thank you to our sponsor, Factor, for helping us out with today's video. More on this during lunch. Smoothies. Hey guys, today is gonna be crazy. We're working on a super old muscle car, and you know I love the stories and the history, and this is no exception. This is a 1964 Dodge Custom 880. And you look at it, and you're like, yeah, looks like any old muscle car. But the story behind this is insane. Here it is. In 1963, this car was actually purchased by Horace Dodge Jr., the son of the Dodge brothers, for his mother. Now, before he could actually see his mother drive the car, he ended up dying. So now the mother has the car, she's driving around. I can only imagine the emotions of her son giving her this car and then passing away. In 1928, way before this, Dodge Brothers sold the company for $170 million. That's $3 billion in today's money. So Mrs. Dodge was arguably the wealthiest woman in the world at the time. And in 1994, she puts it up for auction in Detroit. Now, a gentleman named Ralph Wilson, he buys the car. Turns out he owns the Buffalo Bills football team. He bought this for his girlfriend, soon to be wife, Mary. Mr. Wilson then dies. So then Mary says, you know what? I need to donate this car to my favorite charity, which happened to be WDET, which is a Detroit radio station and NPR channel 101.9. So they reached out to me and said, hey, we're gonna raffle this car off for $101.90, meaning each ticket. Would you be willing to clean this up, remove the mold, get this so that when the person drives it, when they win the raffle, they can just drive it and not have any fear of anything? And I said, absolutely. So this is the story of cleaning Horace Dodge Jr.'s car. I can't believe Dodge's car is in here. I'm so excited. So we're gonna get this thing cleaned up and off to a new home today on this episode of Drive and Protect. As you can see, there's some spots of rust here and there. The chrome needs some love. The paint is a bit chalky. The interior has mold, seats are splitting, and the carpets are very dirty and quite smelly, but I love this car. Now, as I mentioned, the 880 is being raffled off with 100% of the ticket sales benefiting WDET Radio in Detroit. Each ticket costs $101.90. I'll put a link down below if you want a chance to win this piece of automotive history. But for now, step one is to remove the interior. All right, so we're heading over to Steve's right now because if you look underneath the bench seat in the front, it's just all rusted out. And I'm worried if I take those bolts out, they may break. Another one, I want to see if he has any fancy tricks or anything or some sort of penetrating oil to put on there. I don't want to back this out. Again, I'm doing a preservation detail on something that's really historical. I'm not looking to break anything. Hey, Spanky, what are you doing? You need help? Let me show you. Ah, blaster. Oh, look, mouse. I see mice right there. One of the best ways to remove a rusty bolt without using a blowtorch is to put some penetrating oil on it first and then loosen and then tighten, loosen and then tighten. Just kind of go back and forth slightly because you don't want to just immediately loosen it because you have a potential breaking in the process. With three of the four nuts now removed, the fourth bolt was actually broken before we got started. Jordan and I popped the seat out and put it to the side for now. Why are you tripping? Next, I remove the door sill kick panels that hold the carpet Ooh. down along the edges. And once I remove that, look at the original color when it came from the factory. Incredible what the sun can do to carpets and paint over time. This is a perfect example. To get the carpets out completely, I had to remove one last piece of trim before pulling the original or old adhesive and removing the carpets from the floorboards. Ooh. Now check this out. During my initial vacuuming, I found an old school, genuine Ace hard rubber comb. I know this sounds crazy, but this th these were the rage in the 1960s. These types of hard rubber combs date back to the 1850s and were immortalized by automotive icons like James Dean and of course, Elvis Presley and John Travolta and Saturday Night Fever. So it was really cool to see an original artifact under the seat mixed in with, of course, a lot of junk and grime. 
After my initial vacuum, I then use compressed air to kind of flush everything out. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but if I don't do the initial vacuum first, then blow everything out, the debris goes everywhere and is somewhat uncontrollable and gets into my camera and causes issues and so on. So for me, it's easier just to vacuum twice. With the floorboards now clean, I quickly scuffed up the oxidation in preparation for my rust inhibitor application. Again, it's much easier to remove as much of the loose stuff as possible before applying a few thin coats of rust inhibitor. It's just going to stick a lot better. With the rust prevention and primer now drying, I focused on cleaning the original carpets. So step one is to power wash the fibers with warm water to loosen up and remove as much as possible without chemicals or aggressive agitation. Again, we're doing all of this in this preservation mindset, meaning I would just replace the carpets, obviously. But in this case, we want to take our time. We just want to keep as much originality in the car as possible for the next owner. Next, I use the diffuser to stand the fibers up so that the next step, meaning the chemicals, can get deep into the carpet before agitating with the drill brush. Look at that. That's after power washing, scrubbing, blowing out with the air, and you still have that junk in there. This really needed it. We continue. Now with all of that, I then let it drip dry, hanging over a stand for the next few days. But you can already see a drastic color difference from beginning to end, and the smell is much better. My thought is that the smell probably came from the mold, so this was really important to kind of flush everything out and start fresh. With my carpets now crying outside, I removed the mold and grime from the doors, the dash, and the seats with lather, an interior brush, and a microfiber towel. To make sure everything fits. The next day, I reinstalled the dry carpets and reapplied 3M adhesive to secure the sound deadening and carpet to the floorboard. Once everything was down, I then secured the carpet with the footwell trim, but the kick panel needed some extra cleaning before reinstalling. To do that, I used plum wheel cleaner and 4 aught steel wheel just to remove the heavy pitting. Then I polished with a 1 inch wool pad before screwing it back down to secure the edges of the carpet. Finally, we replace the seats and then fasten them down. There it goes. Boom! Legit, that was the fastest window up and down I have ever seen in my entire life. 
All right, with the interior now cleaned, reinstalled, I'm telling you right now, it smells a thousand times better. That means it's lunchtime. Now, when it comes to lunch food, I know this sounds crazy, but I get so involved, so excited about doing these cars, I literally forget to eat lunch, and it goes four or five hours, and then, of course, I crash. If I do that two or three days in a row on the third or fourth day, I end up getting sick, so I have to actually carve out lunchtime. The second thing is, I don't like leaving, because then I get out of my mindset on the car. What am I gonna do next? I'm gonna do this. What about that thing? And I forget something. So I have factor delivered here. Plus factor, the food itself is high quality ingredients. We're gonna run upstairs, heat it up, wolf it down, and then I'm gonna start the wash process. So I gotta go eat lunch. Every week I check out their menu online and with 34 chef prepared, dietitian approved weekly options, I always seem to find something to eat, including snacks, smoothies, juices, and so on. For me, it's about good food shipped to my door, cooked in two minutes so I can get back to polishing and running my business. Head over to factor75.com or click the link down below and use promo code AMMO50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. This stuff is really good. With the hubcaps removed, I power wash the paint first, then apply Brute instead of foam. I needed that extra strength in this case, and then clean the hubcaps with plump. Okay, so if you're unfamiliar with what clay is, you can see right here, sales will turn a little brown there. If that's fresh, that's dirty. What's happening is there's contamination, there's junk, there's stuff that falls from the trees, from the sky, railways, that kind of thing. Anything that floats, shoo, sticks to the paint and then sort of embeds itself into either clear coat or single stage paint like this one here. You take this thing here, it's sort of like one of those Biore strips that you put on your nose and you peel off the blackheads, that kind of concept. But in this case, you're really kind of shaving it off. So now it's nice and smooth and you don't have these contaminations, these things popping up microscopically within the paint. What that's gonna do is one, you can hear it over here. Hear that? and it's not so loud over here. That means I remove them. From a polishing perspective, why that's really important is as I'm polishing, all those contaminations are being picked up into the pad, and now they're stuck in the pad, and as the pad is rotating, you're taking that little contamination and you're scouring the paint. So you can do two things. One, you can do it now like I'm doing it to try to remove that, to just pull it off the paint so it doesn't get stuck in the pad. Or if you decide to just go alone and do it with the pad, you have to blow the pad out a lot more, more frequently to blow out that contamination so that you have a clean finish and it looks absolutely amazing. So I've decided to take route number one, which is to pull that out and you can see all the metaphorical blackheads within the paint. We're cleaning it up. With the swirled and scratched paint now dry, I started the paint restoration with a straight cut wool pad and exfoliate polish to remove the years of dried out sort of dead single stage paint, revealing a bright white subsurface layer. But I did it with two different polishing techniques. Here's how it works. Okay, at this point in the process, I finished about half the car and I've used two different techniques. First one is a foam pad. I use that mostly on the vertical panels because they're just not as scratched as the horizontal areas. 
probably somebody put a box on this in storage or maybe put some junk on top of it. It's more scratched than the vertical sides. This is really just bringing back the color, sort of cleaning out the pores of the paint and making it a much brighter white. Easy breezy. Cover girl. Now on these areas here, this is where it gets a little more complicated. One, because it's incredibly thin. Two, it's single stage paint. But three, we're using a different technique called the mow down technique. What that does is sort of scratches off, kind of abrades the surface real quick and kind of removes all the dead skin and then I go back in and polish again. The best analogy I can give is let's say it snows two feet in your driveway, right? So now you have this two feet of snow on your driveway, but you only have a plow that can push one foot at a time. So what are you going to do? Well, option one is to put the plow down and plow as much as you possibly can. And that two feet of snow is gonna fall over the plow. It's gonna be all over the place. And as you're trying to push the car or the truck is struggling to get through all of that. And it's just too heavy and too thick. So what people do is they end up raising the plow, right? Like this, raising it up to about this high, maybe about a foot off the ground. And they do the first pass. And they kind of just push that top foot of snow all the way through and they push it to the side and then they'll come back, put the plow all the way down the ground and then push the second foot of snow, if that makes sense, the, the lower foot of snow. That conceptually, metaphorically, is what's going on here. You see that right there after the first cut? See how matted down that is? That is, see that on my fingers? All the whiteness there? That is the paint actually coming off. So that's the, the second foot of snow. I'm just, I'm just wiping all that off, just scooping all that off. Then I'll go back in afterwards and take care of the bottom foot which is after I blow this out, I'll put one or two more dots and go in. But you do want to keep a smaller surface area that you're working because there's so much paint, so much skin coming off this in order to get all the scratches out. So it's a kind of a double-edged sword. We're using two different techniques. This thing is a battleship. I'm exhausted, but it's going to look absolutely fantastic when we're done. So I'm really excited. Okay, at this point, I've removed all the dead skin off the paint and it looks fantastic. Now, the downside is it makes the chrome look even worse because the paint is so good. Now I have to focus on that, what we call the bright work. So in 1964, car manufacturers used a lot of chrome or chrome plating because it prevented or minimized corrosion. Now, fast forward 59, almost 60 years later, yeah, you're probably gonna see some pitting and things that's kind of normal, especially because this one sat outside. And you can see there's actually rust on the paint, but very little on the chrome showing how strong chrome is. With all that being said, we do have to clean it. And listen, I've washed, I've scrubbed, I've done everything to this and it's still there. Now there's varying degrees of what we can do. So like when it's really clean, you know, you polish it up by hand and you're good to go. When it's like this, what I call medium, you're gonna have to use some steel wool and some acid. And then when it's really bad, when it's totally pitted, you have to replace it. So we're right in the middle here. So what I do is I use four aught steel wool, which is the lightest steel wool. There's zero, two zeros, three zeros, and four zeros, four aught they call it. This is the steel wool that I'm using. It's the lightest, it's the most gentle. If you go a little bit stronger, you might put a, some scratches and some fine marks in there that you have to polish out and it's not fun to do that. So use the lightest one. And then in terms of acid, I don't manufacture acid. I manufacture plum, which is more alkaline and safer for 99% of the situation. But when you need to throw a bomb at something like this, where well, this is just way, it's, we're just trying to salvage this at this point. I'm using this one, Chrome Cleaner from Mothers. It stinks to high heaven, so you do need to put on a mask. You should put some goggles on and glasses. It is very, very strong, and I do think it has its purpose, and its purpose would be when you have corrosion, when you have something like oxidation or rust, for lack of a better word, you need to let that sit for a minute or two, then go in. I'll show you right now, but you don't want to play with this all the time, so I'm the little disclaimer there. Normally, I would hit everything with plum and go alkaline base, but this time, because of all the minerals and the rust and the oxidation, I'm going the other direction. I'm going acid, so keep that in mind if you're trying to restore light oxidation on chrome.
For those of you wondering, this cleaner contains phosphoric acid with a pH of about one and likely other surfactants mixed in. So it's pretty corrosive. Just don't let it sit there for too long without removing it and you should be in good shape. But doing a test spot first is always a good idea if you're unfamiliar with the product. On older cars and engine base, there's just a ton of room in there and usually they're painted. If you can see here, both sides, both edges have this paint on it that's on the outside of the car too. But in this case, it's usually much thinner than the exterior paint. So what I'm gonna use here is a three inch foam pad and I'm not polishing, I'm just cleaning. So instead of using an alkaline base cleaner, like a degreaser on that area and then, and then agitating, going back and forth and rinsing it. In this case, I'm using the foam pad. That foam pad is just gonna pull out the dirt in the pores, but I'm not really lowering the paint. So I do think it's a little bit safer in this case on the engine of course i'm using a degreaser i'm going to you know use my brush and go in there you can rinse it down or you can wipe it down like i did here but on those edges use a foam pad very gently and then you know that you're going to throw that foam pad away you're never going to use that on the paint that was just designed to pick up the dirt that was in the pores of the paint within the engine bay Okay, at this point, we're getting so close. This thing is looking really good. We always have to address the plastic or Lexane rear window. It's very common now. This particular one just needs to be replaced. But again, with that whole preservation mindset in place for Mr. Dodge's car, we're gonna leave it as is. We're not replacing anything, but I do wanna brighten it up a little bit. It's fairly simple to do, but you have to keep in mind, this is very soft. So we don't wanna put a ton of downward pressure. I'm using a foam pad, I have exfoliate polish. The idea here is just to really, uh, no pun intended, exfoliate the skin of this plastic here. I have it on about half speed here, about three or four, not super fast. And you're just going back and forth. I do move my hands a little bit faster than I would on paint because the idea is I'm not trying to heat this up too much. Every once in a while, it would become really gummy. Overall, I'll finish the rest of this and it'll look pretty good. Finally, I added blush paste wax to the paint instead of a coating to sort of keep it period correct, meaning it's a muscle car, and plus it's just fun to wax an old car. I love doing that. That bird is going off. He's like, I am going to poop on it the instant it comes out to show you how much I love your car. Then I cleaned the windows, I reinstalled the hubcaps, which is really cool, and then I applied mud to the shoes. Okay, we're nearly done with this project. The last step is just to protect the interior the best we can. As you can hear, it's very brittle. So as soon as you sit on this, you're causing more and more damage. When it came in, it had this towel, and obviously that was just for when the drivers got in and out moving the car. They didn't do more damage than is already here. And the idea is, as a preservation detail, we don't wanna replace any of this stuff. So I went online. I found twin bed sheets that kind of look like that. We're gonna put them on uh, both the front and the back just to protect it as it moves out and goes to auction. So that's the next step, making a very large car bed, I guess. <laughs> Again, this is just a preventative measure to avoid further damage as it makes its way around the country before the raffle of people getting in and out and moving it, that sort of thing. Then I applied a little bit of double-sided tape just to keep the sheets down around the seats before pulling her outside and seeing her in the sun. Duh. Wipers work.
started right up. It's my champ. Whoa, you can barely turn. And you got this thing right here. So imagine a 1964 cruising around top down. This is pretty cool. Driving Dodge's Dodge. Thank you! <laughs> oh, this car is just too cool. I wish there was a parade around. This feels very parade -y type car. I just have my own parade. <laughs> we did it. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Dodge. That's quite an experience. Very cool. As always, guys, if you have any questions, you know where to find me, Larry at AmmoNYC.com. I'll put a link down below to have a piece of history for $101. You can't beat that. What a privilege. Now, watch this. I'm going to put this thing in the park. Check this out. I got to flip this. How cool is that? So now I'm in park. And if I want to go to drive, I slide this over and then I hit drive. Now I'm going forward, neutral. Or if I want to go reverse, now I'm in reverse, going backwards. Is that cool or what? Unbelievable. Plus, you can play an eight track at the same time. Pretty cool. <laughs> I'll talk to you guys later. I am so happy right now. This is amazing. Buying a truck that can clean itself, so cool.